Well, good morning. It's great to be with you uh, this morning. My name is Tim, and we're going to get into that in just a touch. Before we do, a quick word on uh, what Dawson has said. You might have been sitting there thinking, you know, of course Dawson says that. He's just reading from the script the church staff gave him. Um, that's not true, actually. Uh, Dawson and I caught up a couple of months ago. Dawson has just recently come on board to the office holders for our church, which is uh, really great, and we're excited by that. I can't even remember how, but we kind of just got onto the concept of church and giving and, and those sorts of things. And Dawson started to talk about pretty much everything he's just shared then. And I thought, wow, you know, you're really challenging me to think about what it looks like to be generous. And so I thought, hey, we should all hear what Dawson and Jules and uh, how God's taken them on a journey. And so, um, yeah, just know he didn't say what I told him to say. That's Dawson just right up front. So um, praise God for the way they, I suspect, challenge all of us uh, in what it looks like to be generous people. So why don't you uh, join me? Let's pray and ask God for his help here. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, the time we have now to get stuck into your word. Thank you for the blessing it is to search your scriptures. We thank you that there will come a day when you will bring justice on the earth, when you will right every wrong, when you'll correct every evil. But Lord, we also ask that you would this morning help us to see how we might be able to endure and stand down on that day. Please uh, open our eyes to see how we might stand. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I reckon every one of us in the room, myself included, has something within us that cries out for justice. Uh, this was really brought home to me during the week. I play basketball on Tuesdays. And Tuesday was one of those games that wasn't particularly fun because it was one of the games where you feel like everything is going the opposition's way. It's one of those games where people on the team start to entertain the possibility that maybe, just maybe, the other team have paid off the refs. You know, one of those games, just everything's going the wrong way. And myself, like, I was feeling like the whole thing was unfair as well. Uh, for example, they called me for three seconds in the key. That's because they didn't see that I got out of the key and then I got back in. It wasn't three seconds. Uh, they called me for hooking some guy's arm as he took a shot. He hooked me! Um, but the worst part, actually, was... Uh, 12 seconds to go. We're ahead by one, and we turn the ball over. And so I go for the ball, and they called a foul on me, but not just any old foul. They called it an unsportsmanlike foul. I was going for the ball. But that they said, basically, they think I'm attacking this guy. As a result of that foul, they get two shots. They sunk both of them, and so now they're ahead, and they also get possession back with 12 seconds to go. There was something deep within me in that moment, crying out for justice. I suspect you've had your own version of that kind of thing. Um, we all long for justice. We have something within us that cries out for justice. But I actually think it goes beyond our own personal experiences. Because I think, I don't know if you've noticed, but kind of there is a bit of a cultural movement at the moment, particularly among millennials, crying out for social justice. So justice that's broader than simply ourselves. And so whether it's getting kids off Nauru, whether it's pursuing fair trade, whether it's gender equality, whether it's liberating uh, uh, modern-day slaves, as our friends next door at the Freedom Hub are committed to, I think we're part of a generation that is passionate about justice. We want to do whatever we can, whether it's in person, online, or the power of the purse, we want to see justice come. And so with that in mind, there is, I think, some parts of our passage this morning that our culture more broadly would give a hearty amen to. Uh, verse 5, we'll, we'll dig into the details a little later, but God says he's going to come and he's going to testify against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the fatherless and widows, who deprive foreigners of justice. I reckon people in our culture would look at verse 5 and go, Amen to that. You know, God cares about justice? Good, so do I. And so it might surprise you to hear me say this, but I do think that there are certain elements within the present cultural moment that we're in that is deeply biblical. That is where right to, to cry out for justice. Because at least on some of these issues, we're singing from God's songbook. However, even if there are elements of today's passage that everyone in our culture would give a hearty amen to, there's also some other things that are giving us a warning. Because today we're going to see that God is going to say, be careful what you wish for. You long for justice? Good. But be careful what you wish for. There, uh, the whole idea of saying, be careful what you wish for, it's kind of an interesting line to apply to a passage that deals with God. 
because usually that phrase is applied or it's at least explored in movies that deal with making a deal with the devil and failing to specify the qualifications. Uh, so if you've ever seen the movie Bedazzled, it kind of looks, it's, I think it's got Liz Hurley in it. Uh, it's one of those movies where it's, you basically, you know, it's classic, it's kind of a loner and he's a bit of a geek and he makes a deal with the devil and says, I want to be rich and I want to be married to someone beautiful. But that's all he says. And so he gets what he wishes for, but it's not quite what he was after. And so the next morning he kind of wakes up and he is rich because he's a South American drug lord, but all his enemies want to kill him. And he's married to someone who's beautiful, but she hates him. Be careful what you wish for. There's a sense in which this passage is similar, not because you're making a deal with the devil, far from it, but because when you cry out for justice, God hears the cry and he will bring justice. That's actually the message of our passage. The day of justice will come, but it's not just going to be justice for me and my basketball game. It's not just going to be social justice, it's going to be divine justice. And that cuts through all things. He's going to right every wrong. He's going to correct all evils. And so the shock, if you like, the surprise of this morning's passage is that not everyone who cries out for justice will endure the day of its coming. Not everyone who cries out for justice will endure the day of its coming. Today's talk in the brochure is called Uh, enduring righteousness i've changed the name it's called enduring justice and that's because the question that we're really answering today or at least asking is how can we endure the day of justice when it comes how can we endure it and the way that we're going to answer it is simply through working through the passage that malachi that we had read out for us before Uh, this morning i don't know if there's ever bells and whistles in my talks but there's no bells and whistles today Uh, Sometimes we're like, you know, what does it look like for Malachi? And then we come across here and it's like, what does it look like for us today? Uh, If you've heard me speak before, that's kind of what I always do. Um, I'm merging the two today. And the structure of the talk will just be the structure of Malachi. So no bells and whistles. Um, And I think it's most helpful if you break the the passage up into five parts. As I'll give them to you. I'll give them again as we go through. But here's what we're going to see. Israel is going to make an accusation, and then God is going to respond in four parts. So he's first of all going to make a statement of fact, then he's going to ask a penetrating question, then he's going to provide a comforting promise, and then he'll give them a stern warning. So Israel makes an accusation against God. God responds with a statement of fact, a penetrating question, comforting promise, and a stern warning. That's where we're going. Um, Why don't we get into it? Uh, as we do, if, if you've kind of forgotten any of the details about Malachi, or, or maybe you, this is one of your first weeks with us, just a quick reminder on the details as to Malachi. Get your Bibles open, get it on your phone or, or whatever, that's fine. Uh, Malachi is doing ministry in about the year 460 BC. Uh, he comes to the people of God. They've just returned from exile in Babylon, and now they're back in the land of Judah. But life in Judah is really hard. And so because of how hard life is, they're starting to get bitter and angry towards God. Uh, But more than that, they're getting half-hearted in their faith. They're thinking, what's the point? And so God sends the prophet Malachi to them to call them back to a life of true devotion. And in particular, Malachi addresses five key areas. Um, two uh, Two weeks ago, we saw that they were unworthy in their worship. Last week, we saw that they're unfaithful in their relationships. Today, we're seeing that they are unjust in their practices. And so God, in today's passage, is going to call them back to justice. But there is more than that, and that's what I want to show you now. Most uh, disputations, as we've looked at them in the series, uh, kind of follow the same formula. So God will say something, the people will question God, and then he'll explain and elaborate. Today's is no different. So come with me, take a look at verse 17. And this is where we really jump into that first big idea I said, Israel's accusation. So take a look at verse 17 says, you've wearied the Lord with your words. You've wearied the Lord with your words. Now, that's actually an achievement. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but God says in, I think it's Isaiah, I'm the creator. I do not grow weary or get tired. Malachi's like, you've wearied the Lord with your words. Uh, When your words are more wearisome to God than creating the world, you know you've got a problem. But they are emotional vampires. They're just sucking all the energy out of God. 
And so they predictably say, well, how have we wearied him, you ask? And God says two things, kind of quoting them. He says, by saying, all who do evil in the eyes of, sorry, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he's pleased with them, or where's the God of justice? Now, there's two ways you can understand that. The first is literally, and the second is more kind of a vibe, you know, the summary of how they're feeling. So you could say that what they are saying is literal, right? You, if they're actually telling the people of their day, hey, it's okay. Uh, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. So therefore, you know, go off, d- do evil. God's actually pleased with evil people. It's okay to do evil. And, you know, maybe you don't think I'm right. Well, look around. Where's the God of justice? He's not going to get you. You're fine. Go for it. You could read it that way. But given kind of where the rest of the passage goes, I don't know that that's really what he's saying. Instead, it's probably better to see it as a summary of the general mood of the people of God. As if they're looking around at the prosperity of all the nations around them and comparing that to the poverty that they were experiencing and wondering, where's the justice that we're wanting? See, in Isaiah, uh, chapter 3, verse 10 and 11... God tells them, it says, tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, disaster is upon them, they will be paid back for what their hands have done, right? That's justice, where the good, where the righteous are rewarded and the wicked get punished. But you can just imagine Israel, well, they're kind of looking around and going, well, honestly, it looks like the opposite is true. We're the people of God and the nations are the wicked pagans. And so why is God blessing them and not us? And so it's as if they're crying out to God, God, where's the justice? Where is the God of justice? Bring your justice. You said you're just, where's the justice? And so I just want you to notice before we move on that the question isn't really a question. It's an accusation. In week one of the series, God says to his people, I have loved you. And they respond, how have you loved us? In other words, you haven't loved us. You're not loving. It's the same here. Where's the God of justice? In other words, you're not just. And so the first reason that uh, God's people, the Israelites, are wearying the Lord with their words is that by their questions, they're calling him unjust. But it goes deeper than that. Because behind the question is an inbuilt assumption about themselves, isn't it? They think that they're among the righteous. And so therefore, if God does come and bring justice like they want him to, well, he's going to bless them, shower them with all sorts of blessings, and then wipe out everyone else. So it's not just an accusation, it's a self-righteous accusation. And so God's response, what is it? Well, in summary, God says, you want justice? Great, so do I, but be careful what you wish for. And as I said, the response is going to come in four parts. The first one, he's just in verse 1. He's going to make a simple statement of fact. Let's look at it together. Verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Now, there's a few things in there, um, but just notice that God says two separate individuals are going to come. The first he describes as his messenger, who's going to come and prepare the way before him. Um, This whole idea of sending a messenger to prepare the way, uh, God is kind of playing on the idea in the ancient Near East when sort of a king or an overlord would often, when coming to inspect his kingdom or, you know, a section, would send a messenger ahead of him to clear the way and get people ready. It's not a perfect illustration, but you kind of get a sense of this with the recent visit of Prince Harry and Rachel from Suits. Um, (laughs) I think she's got an official name, but I'm not quite sure what it is. But you've seen it with them because the royal motorcade and the the royal guard or whatever it is, they kind of go ahead of them to clear the way and get people ready for the royal couple that follows. God says, this first character is going to go ahead of me and prepare the way for when I come. That's the first character, the messenger. But the second character is described here as the Lord you are seeking. Remember, they said, where's the God of justice? God says, the Lord you're seeking is going to come. And then he he uses, basically, he says the same thing with a slightly different language. This time he calls him 
uh, the co- messenger of the covenant whom you desire. But this second idea, okay, there's going to be a Lord who's going to come. Now, before we ask the question, all right, well, who exactly are these figures? I just want you to notice the language that is used to describe this second character. Because notice, God has said, the messenger is going to come and prepare the way for me. But then rather than saying, then suddenly I will come to the temple... Or even then suddenly the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is a translation of the word Yahweh, then Yahweh will come to his temple. He says, then the Lord will suddenly come. Now, the Lord is a translation of the word Adonai, which is just literally Lord. That doesn't normally refer to God in the Old Testament. It's more like master or uh, maybe in this context, king is a more helpful translation. And more than that, this Lord is coming to His temple. The temple is described as His. And and so I just want you to notice right up front that God seems to be using language to describe this second figure, which normally would only be reserved for God Himself. And so He seems to be some kind of divine king figure that's going to come. So we ask ourselves the question, well, all right, who exactly are each of these characters? When you ask questions like that, uh, particularly if you're here and you're new to the Bible or Christianity, it's sometimes helpful to ask, all right, well, does the Bible answer that question for us? Because that would be helpful. Uh, In the first case, it actually does for this one. And so take a look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 7 to 10. So who's the messenger, we're asking? Well, Jesus says in verse 7, well, it, it begins, As John the Baptist's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. You know, what did you go out to into the wilderness to see? Was it a prophet? Yes. In fact, I tell you, more than a prophet. Because this is the one about whom it's written. And then he quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. And so, Jesus tells us that the messenger whom God is going to send ahead of himself is none other than John the Baptist which kind of makes it easy to figure out who the divine king is, doesn't it? Because John the Baptist's job was to prepare the way for Jesus. So if the, divine, if the messenger is to prepare the way for the divine Lord, then who's he? Well, it's obvious. Jesus is the Lord, the messenger of the covenant, the divine king that people were seeking. So they say, God, you're not just. Where's your justice? God says, I'm going to send two individuals. Well, two individuals are going to come. One's my messenger and then one's a divine king. But next, he's going to ask a penetrating question. And it comes in verse 2. Look at it with me. But who can endure the day of his coming? Now, his, remember, is the divine Lord, so I'm just going to call him Jesus. Who can endure the day of Jesus' coming? Who can stand when Jesus appears? For Jesus will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Israel had a question. Where's the God of justice? God says, he's coming. But I've got a question for you. Will you be ready when he does? Can you endure the day of his coming? Do you think you'll be able to stand when he comes? Psalm 130 verse 3 says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? The implied answer, there is nobody. Nobody could stand. Why? Because the day of his coming will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Now, soap didn't actually exist at the time that Malachi is writing, so it's not an ideal translation. Um, But the refiner's fire does get to the heart of what is actually being said about the coming of Jesus. Because the refiner's fire was used when you're working with precious metals to separate the good from the bad. And so the point of verse 2 is to invite the people of God to some healthy introspection. All right, you want justice, do you? Well, that's good because God is going to bring justice. He is going to destroy evil once and for all. But before you get too excited about that, just ask yourself, are you going to be ready for the day that he does? It's a penetrating question. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, he was a Russian novelist who was quite outspoken in his critique of the Soviet Union. One of his most favourite novels is called The Gulag Archipelago. Uh, The Gulag was the Soviet concentration, sorry, the Soviet forced labour camps. Solzhenitsyn spent some time in that. If there was ever anyone 
who would be justified in kind of separating the world up into two groups. You know, there's them and then there's us. There's the evil people and there's the good people. God, just destroy them. It would be a guy like Solzhenitsyn. But listen to what he says in that book. He says, if only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessarily only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who's willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Israel thought, when the God of justice comes, he's going to destroy the evil and shower blessings on the righteous. They also thought, that's great, because we're among the righteous, and they're all wicked. Solzhenitsyn says it's not that simple. Because the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And so to think that you will be fine on the day of justice just shows that you don't quite grasp the state of your heart. There may be some good in there, but there's also some evil. And so if you long for justice, the day for God to destroy evil, that means he's going to destroy you. Just take a moment for me. I don't know what you believe. I know we've got lots of different kinds of people in the room this morning. But the Bible's really clear that there will come a day when God brings justice to the earth when he will right every wrong, correct every evil. Supposing that does happen, just for a moment, how do you think you're going to experience that day? Do you think you'll be able to stand? Do you think you will endure? You know, yes is actually an appropriate answer, and we'll come to why in a moment. But I want you just to pay careful attention, if your answer is yes, as to why. Because if you say yes, why? Well, because I'm a good person, because I care about social justice, because I'm committed to the poor and the oppressed. That's great. And again, we'll come to that. But it's got nothing to do with your ability to stand on the day of justice. Because Solzhenitsyn is right. Everyone, myself, yourself included, have a bit of evil in our heart. And so on our own, we're not standing on the day of justice. And so we ask ourselves the question, well, if that's true, why, Tim, do you say that yes is an appropriate answer for anyone? The answer is that God, in the next section, makes a very comforting promise. Uh, we're going to look at verses 3 and 4 in just a moment. Uh, as we do, though, heads up, Malachi is going to run with this idea of the refiner's fire. But he's going to pivot in the way that he uses it. Because in verse 2, it's primarily negative, right? It's like surrounded by questions. Who can endure? Who can stand? And so the idea is no one. But he keeps running with the idea of the refiner's fire and starts to apply it in a positive light because it comes to be symbolic of purification and the means by which the people of God can stand. So let's keep going. Remember that the he here is Jesus. So I'll just keep using Jesus. Verse 3. Jesus will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Jesus will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord, this time capitals, will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So the promise here is that Jesus, when he comes, the Lord is going to purify his people. Now, the implication of that is that they'll be able to stand on the day of justice. But what's interesting is that's not where he goes. Instead, where he goes is to talk about the kind of lives that they'll be able to live, the kind of worthy worship that the purified people of God will then be able to offer. Now, if the language of worthy worship rings a bell, it should. Because two weeks ago, we saw the problem with the people was that they had a corrupt priesthood, the Levites, and corrupt offerings. And so they couldn't offer worthy worship. But here, Malachi tells us that the divine king is going to sort this out. Jesus is going to sort this out. He's going to enable them to offer worthy worship. Notice he does it in language that sounds very Israelite. Right? The Levites is going to purify them, and then Judah and Jerusalem and offerings of righteousness. 
But the New Testament says that even though it's described in quite Old Testament language, it's ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. How so? Well, let me take you to two verses. Each of them describe the way that the death and resurrection of Jesus ultimately fulfill that verse. So first of all, the death of Jesus... Let's get the next one for me, thanks. Uh, Titus 2.14 tells us that it purifies us. Take a look. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And so Jesus is the divine king of Malachi that is going to purify his people and allow us to stand on the day of justice. But notice, the point in the purification isn't simply that we stand there and look good, though that might be part of it, but that we're actually devoted to do good. And as I want to show you later, I think that doing good will include things like social justice and a commitment to care for the, the widow and the oppressed. But next, uh, Jesus' death doesn't just purify us. He then it kind of uses the language of this Old Testament idea. And so take a look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, because Jesus' death enables us to offer worthy worship. It says, as you, this is Peter speaking to a group of Christians. He says, as you come to Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so in the Old Testament, only the Levites, that's a tribe of Israel, could be priests. But here we're learning, because of Jesus' death, kind of abolishes that whole priesthood. Now we're all priests. Only the priest could offer a sacrifice. Now we can all offer sacrifices. But it's not lambs and goats, it's spiritual sacrifices, which a couple of weeks ago we learnt were the lives of his people. Lives are those people committed to doing good. And as I said, we're going to see, I think that includes things like social justice. So that's the comforting promise. The day is coming... But those who've been purified by Jesus will stand on the day of coming. But it leads us then into a stern warning. Read with me from verse 5. It says, So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But don't fear me says the Lord Almighty. Now, before we get into the details, a, a quick word on timing here. You'll notice in verse 5, God this time says, so I will come, and then describes something that kind of sounds like a day of justice. But back in verse 1 and 2, we learn that the divine Lord, i.e. Jesus, will come, and that his day of coming is described like a day of justice. And so, you might ask the question, so are there two days of justice? Or is there one day of justice? And why is the day of Jesus coming, kind of before the bit that talks about how he's going to purify us and we'll offer worthy worship? What? The short answer is that the Old Testament didn't really have a clear concept of the two comings of Jesus, first and second coming. And so it tends to just kind of blur the two together, merge them together. Uh, but with the benefit of New Testament hindsight, looking back, what we can say is that the first coming of Jesus is the time where he comes to purify his people, to purify us so that we can, as his people, offer worthy worship and live lives devoted to doing good. And then the second coming of Jesus is the time when he will come to bring justice on the earth, and that's the second coming that's referred to in verse 5, where God says, I will come. But why does God bring it up? Well, remember, the people have said, where's the God of justice? And God's response is, I'm coming. Are you ready for it? Because unless you've been purified by Jesus, I'm going to bring on you the destruction that you so desperately want me to bring on everyone else, that you're crying out, God, destroy my enemies. Unless you're purified by Jesus, you won't be able to endure and so, remember, the, the, today's question, how do we endure the day of justice? The answer is, make sure you're purified by Jesus. Now, maybe to that, you say, all right. Remember the question at, at the start? Uh, we, we said, 
imagine that it does exist, this day of justice. How will you go? Will you be able to endure? Will you be able to stand? And I said that your care for the poor, your being a good person, your commitment to social justice doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you'll stand on that day. Because what we're learning here is even if those things are good, and they are, you're only able to stand if you've been purified by Jesus. So maybe you're here and you say, all right, I'm committed, committed. Uh, I'm convinced, sorry. H- how do I get purified by Jesus? I, w- I want to be purified. I want to stand on the day of justice. How do I actually experience that purification? Take a look at what John says in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, the idea of confession, just so you know, uh, around church circles sometimes confession is associated with going to a church and into a, a box and talking to a priest and confessing your sins. We've already seen that. There's no special priest. We're all priests. Now, there is a biblical theme of kind of confess your sins to one another, but this is talking about confessing your sins to God. And so if you're wondering, you know, how do I get purified? The simple answer is pray to Jesus. You can do that right now, right here in your seat. Confess your sin, say, I'm sorry. Repent of your sin. Repentance is about turning away from your sin, saying, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm not perfect, but I don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. And would you forgive me? Would you wash me clean? Would you purify me? And the promise of this verse is that he will do just that. Because the language of purification, I think, is really powerful. You know, Jesus' death is described as accomplishing a number of different things in the Bible. But I think the language of purification is one of the most existentially powerful. And here's what I mean. Uh, Sometimes sin, there are certain sins or kind of kinds of sin that you do and and it leaves you feeling stained. It leaves you feeling um, unclean. It leaves you feeling like damaged goods. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Like there is something that actually goes deep into your soul and maybe for you it's something that's mentioned in this passage. I don't know. You know, It talks about sorcery. Maybe you've been engaged in you know, a seance or a Ouija board. Maybe you've kind of done something sexually that you feel has left you kind of dirty and, and, and no matter what you do, you know, weeks, days, days, weeks, years, months later, you feel, I still can't rid myself. I still can't wash myself clean. Shakespeare explores this whole idea in Macbeth. Uh, If you don't know the play, that's fine. But it's basically about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, his wife. They conspire together to kill King Duncan. Um, And then the rest of the play, among other things, kind of explores the way that they continue to be plagued by the guilt of what they've done. And so Lady Macbeth, so his wife, at one moment, she kind of ha- she's sleepwalking. And so she's so plagued by the guilt of what she's done that she's sleepwalking around the place and she's dry washing her hands. Now, there's nothing on the hands, but she's like, uh, get out, get out, get out. Um, get out, you spot. Who'd have thought there, there was so much blood on him? She's, it's not like she's having a nightmare, just to feel covered in his blood. Macbeth later on says something similar. It's like, there's not enough water in the ocean to wash my hands of the blood that's on them. The Bible would say that's because they're looking for purification in the wrong spot. The blood of Jesus purifies us. The blood of Jesus gets in where water can't. The blood of Jesus cleanses even the soul. And so I'll say it again. If you haven't yet, confess your sin, seek forgiveness in Christ, turn from sin, trust in Christ. Why? Well, because it's not only, and it is this, it's not only experientially liberating, it's also the only hope you have of standing on the day of justice. Let me finish. It'd be real tempting to finish the talk here and basically go, all right, so we've learned there's a day of justice. God will right every wrong, correct every evil. The only way to stand in that day is to to be made pure by Jesus, so trust in Jesus and you will endure. 
it's tempting to finish the talk here. And that's all true. In, in many ways, I think that's the most important thing I could say this morning. But I think to leave it there wouldn't do justice to the passage. Because it would read verse 5 as if it's purely a checklist of things that you have to ignore, sorry, that you have to avoid if you don't want to get smited by God on the day that he returns. And furthermore, when you discover that in Christ, if you've been purified by him, you don't have to fear the day of justice, it runs the risk of making verse 5 sound irrelevant. Because it's like, oh, well, it doesn't matter about those things. You know, God's going to testify again. Oh, well, I'm fine because I've got Jesus. And so I'll say it again. I think to finish the talk there and say, go, you know, trust in Jesus, misses the heart of God as it's revealed in the passage. Because verse 5 is not some random list of things that God just decided to get angry about. To a greater or lesser degree, they're all about caring for the weak and the vulnerable. I think it's increasingly more obvious as you go through the list. So sorcery, verse 5. Sorcery was the Old Testament equivalent of false teaching. So you led kind of um, the gullible away, ultimately, to their destruction. Adultery is about taking advantage of someone by sleeping with their spouse. Perjury is about lying in court and depriving someone else of justice. And I think, again, they, they all get more and more clear. You know, defrauding the labor of, of the wages, you're not giving them their due. Oppressing the widow and the fatherless, they can't care for themselves in that society, and so when you oppress them, you take advantage of them. And then depriving the foreigners among you of justice. They're not some random list. The, the reason that God mentions them here and says, I'm going to testify against those who do them, is that God cares about people, and therefore God cares about justice. Because you might say, oh, well, who cares, you know? What does it matter what God cares about? I've been purified by Jesus. I'm fine. Well, think back to the jeweler and the purifying fire. Because it's often said that the jeweler knew he was done when he could see his reflection in the pool of liquid metal. I'm refining, I'm refining, I'm refining, I'm refining. Get rid of the dross. Bam, there's my image. Okay, I'm done. It's the same with God. The sign that you've been purified by Jesus is that you increasingly grow to reflect his image. And that includes a heart for justice. So he's sometimes asked, you know, what's the relationship between Christianity and social justice? Well, I think today's passage kind of helps us address this question. The answer is, caring about social justice doesn't save you, but saved people care about social justice. Caring about social justice doesn't save you. It's not going to help you stand. But saved people care about social justice. I think the history of Christianity is full of examples where you see this to be true, whether it was Wilberforce and the abolition of slavery, or multiple examples, you know, um, the setting up hospitals or setting up schools or fighting for human rights. Uh, Christians have often led the charge in making sure that every man, woman and child gets, uh, is treated with equal value and dignity because they're created in the image and likeness of God. I think, if I'm honest, this has probably been, for me, a major blind spot until pretty recently. You know, Israel seemed pretty clueless about a bunch of the issues that God comes to address. Uh, what do you mean we're not treating you with honour? Well, you're defiling the sacrifices. What do you mean we're being unfaithful? Well, you know, I wonder if maybe God say, we might say, what do you mean we're being unjust? Is it an area of half-heartedness for us that we just kind of don't really think into these issues? This week I found myself wondering, have I been complicit in depriving labourers of their wages by not buying things that are explicitly fair trade or um, upfront about ethical work practices? Have I been complicit in the oppression of the fatherless by not speaking up for the rights of the unborn who are murdered in our hospitals every day? Am I being complicit in depriving foreigners of justice by not speaking up for those who seek refuge in our nation? Now, honestly, I've finished the week with more questions than I have answers. But what I have finished the week is with, is with a renewed determination 
to reflect the heart of God on these issues. And that's a God who cares deeply about people and therefore a God who cares deeply about justice. Now, I'm one person, I can't do it all. But I can do something, and so can you. And so what I have finished the week thinking is, how can I, as the individual, seek to make a difference, seek to make sure that every man, woman and child is created in the image and likeness of God, gets treated with the dignity that they deserve. The series is called True Devotion. I think this morning we're seeing that true devotion is expressed through the devotion of purified people to reflect the heart of God. And that's a God who cares deeply about justice. Would that also be true for us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing your heart to us in this passage. Lord, we long for justice. But sometimes we want you to bring justice on others and not us. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place for our sins so that we might be purified, so that our wrongs might have been brought justice in his death. But now as your cleansed, purified people, may you help us to be devoted to doing good. Would you help us to more and more reflect your heart, your heart for the weak, the vulnerable, the oppressed? And would you show us what it looks like for each of us in our own separate individual lives to be people pursuing the love of our neighbour, people created in your image and likeness. Amen.